Hey guys, Vorlesi here. Thanks for watching the channel. Today I'm going to be talking about infinity terrain, setting up tables, layout, that kind of thing, uh, terrain theory. So uh, please sit around and enjoy as I go through quite a lot of that uh, kind of discussion. Just a first disclaimer, I'm going to begin by talking about overall tabletop you know, theory for Infinity, which should be applicable, um, you know, no matter whether you play on the online tabletop simulator or you're playing real games of Infinity with actual real um, terrain uh, and setting up tables uh, for yourself or playing on other people's tables or even setting up uh, for tournaments where maybe you're organizing the, the tournament and you're not even participating in the game. So there'd be a lot of that holistic sort of theory to begin with. Um, for a large section of the video towards the later end, I am going to be talking about stuff that purely pertains to the tabletop simulator simulator how to actually you know work with the tools uh, online so what I want to tell you is that uh, there'll be something there for everybody although there will be a section through this video where you may want to switch off and, and watch a different video if you're not planning on playing a tabletop simulator having said that um, I really encourage everybody to give it a go we've had a massive turnout in um, discord recently um, there's like over 50 people I think now over 40 or 50 people and we've been playing tons of games this lately it's been heaps of fun check out my other content on it we're getting a lot better at making uh, it a lot smoother getting better at avoiding the small inconsistencies and annoyances of the game and just it's turning out to be a really good experience anyway back to tabletop theory so uh, what we're looking at here is the, the simulator, although I'm using this to demonstrate, you know, what can be done in real life games of Infinity as well, obviously. So you've got your 4x4 four four table, your two, two 12 inch deployment zones. Bear in mind that some Infinity missions these days use a different deployment setup, either 16 inches in or in power pack, the little squares on the either side. Uh, we won't be uh, going into much detail about that, we're generally going to be assuming the standard deployment zone since that's used most commonly. So let's dive into it. Infinity is a game where terrain really matters. It's one of the best things about the game, to be honest. It, it turns the game into something very strategic and tactical. It's about problem solving. You know, there are there are very few no-brainer decisions when it comes to you know moving around the, the terrain or at least setting up ter terrain. It's very thoughtful sort of stuff. Um, when you first get into Infinity and first uh, are confronted with the problem of setting up tables for this game, the first problem that people look to grapple with is you know how much terrain to put on there that's just the age-old question do you have a very open terrain with barely anything on it or do you have tons and tons of terrain um with you know barely any room to move and obviously um the consensus is that just about everybody pr prefers there to be some sort of middle ground there very few people will want to play on a table that's like planet bowling ball where it's just a big grassy field and very few people want to play on a terrain where it's like inside of a spaceship where it's just crates and, and walls and pathways everywhere and no way to sort of see you know a few feet beyond yourself um, before I sort of do any demonstrations, um, I want to start with a really important point about this. And if you only learn one thing from this video, I hope it's I hope it's this point. And I'm going to bring up my um, Microsoft Paint to demonstrate this with a very basic graphic chart. So I want you to imagine that there's a spectrum here where um, all the different ways of laying out terrain on an affinity table um, are in front of you. And if you can imagine on the right hand side. Um, deploying a, a table with absolutely no terrain on it that would be the extreme end where there's absolutely you know no cover whatsoever and the table's completely open whereas on this extreme end you've got a table where there's just so much terrain packed in there that you've barely got space to place your models and there's barely any line of sight because the models are, are constantly obstructed by trees and buildings and scattered terrain and that sort of thing so either neither neither situation is is optimal um, right in the middle here, we've got the absolute perfect board, and this is this is ha hypothetical and abstract because for most people, it's a subjective thing. My my perfect board might be different to your perfect board, but some people feel that it's um, the objective and the overriding goal when setting up a table to always have it to be this exactly perfect balance between too much and too little terrain, where there's just enough line of sight, so there's a few long-range alleyways for snipers and HMGs, rocket launchers, missile launchers, and then there's some tighter terrain in parts of it where uh, shotguns and uh, jammers and chain rifles are going to come in handy. People can get into close combat, and then there's some sight lanes which are quite relevant to the board where their uh, you know, you know, combi rifles and spitfires are going to be really, really useful. So people imagine that that's like the absolute best terrain, uh, the table that 
it will encompass all of those those goals. And, and I generally agree, but my point that I really want to make is that there's a cutoff, really, where in this white area that I'm demonstrating on the graph, say you go a little bit leaning towards the, the open side of the table. So long as you don't go, a go past a particular threshold, it's okay. So you might have a table that feels a little bit more open than you're comfortable with. And my point is that can be an actual really good thing. That can be, um, be great because both players are challenged to try and deal with the problem of, okay, sniper rifles and missile launchers are a little bit more powerful in this particular game. Similarly, you may play on a table that's a little bit more closed than you're comfortable with. There are still opportunities for the snipers and HMGs and long-range stuff, but it's predominantly going to be a table where uh, chain rifles and jammers are going to be quite powerful. And uh, the reason I like playing on a variety of tables uh, that sort of sway between closed and open is that it, it challenges you to always be coming up with balanced lists and including tools in your lists just in case you come across a, a, a table of one or the other variety. And when it comes to tournament play, you can have an environment where maybe you're expecting 20 or 30 people to your tournament and you've got a bunch of tables and some of them are leaning towards uh, the open side of things and some of them are leaning towards the closed side of things. So long as they don't cross over into these areas where, um, you know, it's just too, it's too extreme, right? So, so long as there's going to be no table that just completely trounces you unless you have the better long range game, um, it's okay. And that's why I, I wouldn't really want to be in a tournament situation where every single table was just perfectly balanced. Uh, I'd want some people to be challenged uh, by having to sort of think, okay, for this particular game, I've got this combination of this matchup and this mission and a table that's a little bit more closed. How am I going to deal with that? I find that uh, style is much more thought-provoking and um, you know requires more problem-solving than a situation where everything's just deadly, dead, 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 dead center. So... When you're creating a table, don't be too afraid to make it a little bit further uh, to one side, just as long as you don't go past an extreme. And again, subjective as to where these threshold points are, right? So hopefully we've demonstrated that. Um, another really good point uh, I thought I'd make, in fact, I probably should have got this uh, ahead of time, is um, that in the Infinity um, rulebook, there's actually a demonstration um, where it actually gives you a, um, a diagram about like how you might want to set up a table, for example. Uh, here it is here. I'm glad I managed to find it so quickly. So quite, quite interestingly, uh, Corvus Belli have even got their own sort of suggestion. And this is a very old suggestion now. I mean, this, this, is, this, book's, been, well, this book's been around for quite a while, where if you look at it, um, imagine actually playing in a table that looks like this. Um, you've got very tall terrain in the deployment zones where a sniper can see a huge amount of the board and there are these uh, fairly large open areas in the middle where you have to cross what seems like it would be quite a big distance. Having said that, um, we've actually played a bunch of games where we directly tried to mimic that as closely and as loyally as possible and um, unsurprisingly, the games turned out to be a matter of player decisions and performance, the dice rolls, then the army lists and matchups, and then the terrain in that order. That was what determined the outcome of the game. So, you know, as, as expected, the decisions players made, you know, had the most impact. The dice rolls had the next to most impact. The army lists themselves and the choice of factions was the next most impactful thing and the train was the least impactful thing um, even though we actually went with this kind of setup so it just just goes to show that you can get away with doing something that looks, looks a little bit uh, uncomfortable right even if you have this big building here where you can easily put a sniper on top of it like an intruder and see so much of the approach you know somebody who's a decent player who's actually built a uh, well-rounded list is still going to have a way of, of of dealing with them i mean the intruder's gonna have to fire a shot at some point as soon as he does he reveals himself somebody uh, hits him with an hmg or maybe they've actually taken an msv3 hmg themselves and uh, can just shoot him right off the bat so um don't be afraid to try this kind of thing i don't think this is the absolute best kind of table that you, you can make i prefer a different style of doing it but um you can get away with it is, is the real point there 
Let's come back to Tabletop Simulator for a moment. Um, the cool thing about this is it allows me to just, just sort of copy and paste, you know, direct to scale buildings. And you know, what I might do is just jump in here to um, get a, a model for scale and throw in, um, you know, this Ectros guy. Just so we've got him nearby, just in case we need to, to scale the things up. So um, let's just have a look at it. Let's say we've got a couple of, um, you know, larger larger buildings here. I can even copy paste that. Already you've got, you're starting to see a table where um, a lot of the line of sight's blocked off. Note that there's a big difference between um, putting um, the taller bits of terrain in the middle of the table compared to putting the taller bits of terrain in the deployment zones. So be mindful when you're first setting up that side of, side of things that if you've got the majority of the tall stuff in your deployment zones, it's gonna be a matter of your long range stuff, TR bots or snipers or link team missile launchers, that kind of thing, being able to see the middle of the table and the middle of the table is generally gonna be the most dangerous area. On the other hand, if you put some very tall stuff in the middle and all of the, the stuff in the deployment zones very low and shallow, then you run the risk of somebody having an infiltrating sniper or um, Dow Fei with an HMG or something like that, dominating from the mid midfield where they can deploy high up and possibly see into your deployment zone behind cover with the backs of people's bases sticking out. So uh, I'm not saying that you can't make a table like that. Just bear in mind first as the table creator that that's sort of what you're providing for people. And if you show up to play on somebody else's terrain and you see that kind of setup, be mindful that that kind of strategy is going to be possible. So, you know, deploy a accordingly to that. Another technique that um, people quite often talk about is the distinction between having um, you know, the, the terrain parallel and square with the table edges like I've set it up now versus the alternative, which is actually shifting everything. Let's say I move everything to a different angle. Whoops. There we go. Notice the, the kind of effect that this is gonna have. This is something which um, I know especially the Australian scene like to incorporate, I think, in their in their sort of uh, their tournament setups. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, import some, some crates as well, just so we can do the, a similar sort of thing with the crates. When you've got a lot of stuff um, on an angle, it just changes where the, the lines of fire can come from. With this particular angle, obviously, it's very oblique. So as soon as you um, send guys around this side of the table, the, the long fire lines open up, but you've got to sort of concentrate that on one particular angle so your opponent knows you know, where that's generally going to come from. If we angle it um, even more, like, like this, or angle some of them like in a completely different direction, we start to, to block things off, right? What it, what it does mean though is that you can deploy in such a way that um, if your opponent gets around to the center of the table around your deployment zone, that's where you might not be in cover at all. Um, or you can sort of, uh, if I grab my, my Ectros over here, say you're here, you're safe uh, generally from this side of the table, but once they get around here, you're gonna have no cover. Whereas if it's square, they have to come all the way to your deployment zone to get cover. So it makes this kind of setup a little more, da more dangerous. Um, absolutely, this can be a cool way to play. Sometimes what I like to do is actually have the, the buildings tinted, uh, tilted, but put a little bit of scattered terrain on the backs of the sides, just uh, so you can put a model prone in the deployment zone when they come right around here. But for the middle terrain uh, bits, uh, not so much, right? So uh, just be aware of the kind of effect that it, um, the table can have when you, when you swivel the buildings a bit. Also, if you want the terrain to look thematic, remember if you go into a real sort of a building com com complex and you're sitting in the car park looking at how all the buildings are laid out, quite often there will be a bit of uh, sort of a theme to it and all the buildings will be sort of facing one particular way. It certainly looks a little bit more coordinated that way, like you can imagine a bit a real sort of facility or installation where they've sort of arranged buildings according to a grid with a bit more of an organized system rather than, you know, a war game of just throwing the, the, the bits at the table and just seeing where they land, um, which is not usually how engineers sort of plan out a town or a city, for example. So there is that. Um, one other thing that you quite often see um, in, um, in well-designed tables is just care taken to what happens on the side. Um, note the effect of me placing this here. 
What this means is that um, an airborne deployment trooper can actually come on the side and just stand there without rolling to come on and then just peek around and hit the deployment zone. So if you're putting crates there, expect that kind of thing to happen. Also, um, if you put a lot of stuff along the side here, um, it sort of, it, it, it controls whether or not people are going to be coming down the side of the flank with, say, a bulleteer or something like that. So um, sometimes you might see one side of the table very open and one side of the table very sort of closed off. That's one way you can look at it. Um, that will influence how people uh, think about, okay, am I going to be more likely to be attacked by airborne troopers over here? Am I going to be more likely to be attacked by a tag or a bulleteer coming from that side? Um, all of these possibilities are okay. Just again, be mindful of them when you're creating the table and when you are um, you know, sitting up on somebody else's table and deploying you know, what's about to uh, befall you. Also, um, one thing that we've quite, liked, uh, quite started to do in our, our local scene is um, just cutting off the back of the deployment zone with something. And the idea behind this is that if you've got, um, you know, if you've got a, a regular deployment zone with like these, these crates here, all's well and good, but as soon as somebody lands at the back of your deployment zone, they can see just about all of your army. But if there's uh, a big thing like this, it sort of cuts them off a bit, and you can't get line of sight to everybody without doing a bit more work. So it just sort of, it's a bit of a safeguard to some games being a bit skewed. Like, uh, imagine that I deploy here with my tactical awareness, heavy infantry, pain train, and start walking down the table, shoot a couple of flash pole spots there, and then show up here. If you've got everybody in line of sight down the side there, then they're probably all gonna die. But um, if some people are hidden behind this and over here, then I've gotta do a bit more work. I may run out of orders and you may still have, you know, a third to a half of your army left alive, which might give you a chance to counterattack and, um, you know, throw, throw a grenade or a template my way that might shut me down or something like that because you still have models left. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, I also these days quite like to think about, um, you know, what happens uh, in this particular zone here. Um, quite a lot of models these days have four deployment level one, especially with media infantry getting it for free. So um, just be be aware of how much cover you're going to have available for that kind of thing. Also, if you've got um, a massive sniper tower, which is like specifically here, just bear in mind that your intruder snipers and equivalent people are going to get an extra four inches out here where they're going to be able to deploy right on the edge of that. So if you're if you're deliberately wanting, you know, that kind of unit to have that sort of advantage, then by all means place the deployment the, the, the building like this. And if you don't want them to have that, for example, if there's no mid ground terrain to sort of block them off, then maybe don't put the building there. Um, one thing that sometimes people do is place these boxes on top on top of these bits of terrain, which I think is kind of cool. But don't forget, models can still deploy prone on top of that. Speaking of which, if you've got a bit of a tower in the deployment zone where you know people can easily deploy deploy prone on top of it, right? Just be aware that um, I can't copy it on top. Just be aware that if you've got an even taller building out in the middle, uh, somebody who stands on top of that will be able to see down and the model that's prone on top of this won't actually be um, uh, on a higher level. So they will they will not actually get cover at all if they're, if they're just prone up here, for example. So just be aware of the relative heights of uh, the towers, and so, so to speak. Um, so far, those are a few tips that have come to mind. What I'm just going to briefly do is load up a few of the tables that I've been making lately, just so I can show them off and sort of discuss a little bit of the features of, of tables that have come up uh, lately. All right, so I'll just grab this one, Mototronica Infinity. Before I forget to sort of mention it as well, um, every scenario is going to have a different layout with different objectives. So sometimes it's a good idea when you show up to actually make your table is to uh, put down some objectives first just to see where they're going to be and then set up the terrain around it. Okay, um, so for this one, I think I'll just switch off to the um, actual measurements here. So deployment zone on this side um, is interesting because you can actually deploy, deploy behind this building, which is a really safe place to put um, troopers that can go prone. But if you do go inside the building, you can't actually pass the center line here. 
Um, so putting guys on this side here will be very vulnerable if people come through the door. Whereas um, the wall here is, is partly designed for people that have four deployment level one, they'll be able to deploy next to this doorway or on the wall or on top of the building behind this wall here. So it gives you that opportunity if you've got forward deployment. Forward deployment troopers can also come behind this little wall here, which is not particularly safe or on top of this prone, but again, that's not super safe. If somebody climbs up this, uh, this tower here, they should be able to see models that are at the back of this, uh, but maybe not prone right at the front of this, right? Looking back over here, here's an example of um, you know something that cuts off the deployment zone like I was talking about before. Somebody gets in here, there's only a very marginal line of sight through that little um, little gap along there. Um, and troops down here, you know, relatively uh, safe. Having said that though, there's still a lot of open space in the deployment zone, so you're never feeling fully comfortable. Like if you've got a 20 order list and most of it has to be deployed in your deployment zone, you're having some to make some really hard decisions about where to actually stand. And that's a good thing. You don't want it to be so full of, uh, of material that people can get away with that. On the other hand, um, you don't want there to be nothing at all so that people just don't really have places to hide. Note also we've got these relatively uh, tall, um, you know, double, double crates where if you've got a tag, for example, you've got the choice of, um, you know, one of these options to put them in total cover. Looking at the other deployment zone, again, we've got something really similar. One of these, um, you know, backline blocking crates. This bit's kind of interesting because there's a, a nice spot for a silhouette too, but uh, it's gonna be really hard to hide from somebody who deliberately tries to flank around. Note that um, these crates probably aren't gonna be quite enough to deploy a silhouette trooper for, um, for airborne deployment. Also, there's some pretty good angles from this side to cut them off. So it's not that easy to come over here, but if you do manage to get around to this side, you are rewarded by you know visibility to quite a lot of the deployment zone. Um, this building in here is a, a great spot to put people behind, especially since this containment pod drops people coming around from this side, but it is a bit vulnerable to, to this angle. So at least you know where the enemies are most likely to be coming in from. And you've got cute little spots like this where a silhouette two is gonna be able to be okay right at the back here. Um, but anything larger than that's not, you know, gonna have, a, have such a good time from, from this sort of angle through here. And in the midfield, um, I've actually gone for the option of these two, um, you know, taller triple crate towers where a model deploying on that's not gonna really have much room to move. So they might be able to snipe one or two things in the enemy deployment zone, but they're not gonna be able to sort of move all the way across here without climbing down to see other angles, right? So this table, um, it's not bad. Um, there's plenty of spots for the objectives if we we're playing Supremacy, for example. Um, one of them is even inside a room, which is kind of fun. Um, but this is just one sort of fairly generic layout, which I feel works. Let's look at a completely different one. Um, I'll go for this uh, rustic table, which I created uh, quite recently. Note that I've been playing around with the lighting um, quite a bit as well on, on Tabletop Simulator. So this one is uh, generally based around these cottages and there's um, actually, actually a forest. The way that we do the forest in Tabletop Simulator is that we actually have these um, little fallen leaf templates where if you change the surface to white and zoom in, you can see exactly where your model's gonna be touching the edge of it. So remember, um, moving through that or seeing through that, it's difficult to rain, it's a uh, saturation zone, minus three to hit unless you've got some form of MSV. When it comes to placing forests, um, you'd want to place forests where they're not going to completely dominate the game. Like if there was a massive forest right through this entire section here, that would not be a good thing because um, it's just a bit too uh, overpowering and restrictive. Whereas over here, you're definitely going to have some situations where there are going to be some firefights and some shots um, where people are going to have to contend with that and deal with it. Also, sometimes you're going to need to move to an objective out here. Uh, and you're gonna have to go through the forest to get there or go around it, or it may affect uh, the movement of impetuous troopers. But by keeping the, the forest templates relatively small and kind of off to the side, you have them in a situation where they're, they're affecting the game a little bit, but they're not affecting the game too much, and that's what's really important. Coming to the deployment zones themselves, um, it is a little bit awkward and a little bit tight. It's quite challenging. Like if you put guys along this wall, there's just this one box, but if somebody gets too much of an angle, especially around there, they're gonna be able to see this entire line here. If you put a trooper right at the back here, they're gonna be safe from that. But again, airborne deployment coming through here, if they make even make their way even a little bit through the woods, they're gonna be able to get you. So is that a safe spot for a lieutenant? Well, that's gonna depend on you and your subjective sort of read on it. 
but it's quite hard objectively to say that this is a good or bad spot, and that's a good thing. You want people to be umming, umming and ahhing about what to do. Note that you can't go inside the houses. Again, there's a little spot at the back here, but uh, not very much surface space, and you can't hide a lot of guys there. A pretty decent wall and, and car to hide things behind. This is not really the, the most ideal um, terrain layout. For example, Onyx and OSS, who might have a lot of troopers in a link, you've got to find the right cover for that. But remember, um, you know, sometimes you're playing a scenario where going second is really, really, really important. Um, and uh, you want to deter people from going, you know, straight for the second turn. Uh, because that might mean that they have a, a table side that they can't really defend very well with, and that's something you really want to balance that out with. Over here, uh, this uh, table side is probably a little bit more comfortable because you've got these rocks you can go prone behind. The buildings are, are quite tight with the, um, the car graveyard and the wall. So um, there's, there's enough room really for tag, uh, motorbikes, um, silhouette force sort of stuff, but if you've got too much of that, um, it's going to be a bit of a hassle, a bit of a traffic jam. That's another rule of thumb I have as well, like you, you wouldn't really want to come up with a terrain layout that makes it possible for somebody to spam six motorbikes, for example. I know that six motorbikes sounds really cool, but you don't really want people to you know, be able to get away with taking that kind of stuff and to be able to freely move that, that kind of thing uh, around without actually being shot. Um, so it's, it's better to have a little bit more balance. In the midfield, um, there's a lot more uh, total cover possibilities in the middle because of these houses, but around the flanks, it's fairly open, so that does actually um, cause some problems for some kinds of units. This is a table that I would actually kind of describe as a bit more of an open one. You can't actually go on top of the buildings. Uh, for example, when you um, have the Mototronica terrain where it's just a box and you can go on top of it and prone, that actually gives you a lot more cover opportunities, especially total uh, cover opportunities than you might otherwise think. Whereas with these kinds of buildings with the, the sloped roofs and you can't go on top of them, all you can really do is go prone behind obstacles or if you are a remote that can't go prone or a tag, you have to choose the houses and that can be very restrictive. So just pay attention to that kind of thing with tabletop layout as to whether people can go on top of things and go prone because that's a that's quite a powerful way to utilize total cover um here's a more uh, more recent one that i did as well where um this is probably even more open to be honest so the interesting thing about this table is that it does have a uh, like a level three building in the middle where if you want to deploy your dao fei your infantry infiltrating sniper you're gonna get um, some pretty good line of sight to their deployment zone on either side, basically. There are a couple of houses on each side, so there is a little bit of defense against that kind of thing. But if you've got a 20 order list there and they've got an infiltrating shooter on that roof, you're probably gonna take some casualties. So bear in mind, um, you know, try and use smoke grenades perhaps to, to block things off. Don't forget one tactic you can use if you're defending against that kind of thing is to throw a smoke grenade in such a way that it's landing on top of troopers that need the protection, um, whereas it doesn't protect you. So let's say the sniper is going to shoot your Shaolin Monk or your Gazimotiwa. Let them get the kill, but uh, throw the smoke grenade over to your lieutenant or something that's about to get shot next so that it's a normal roll when you throw the smoke grenade. And when they eventually work around to shoot that model, it's already got a smoke template covering it, right? Um, one thing I've been very deliberate about is to restrict some of the lines of fire. Like I thought that this particular point here was a very powerful sniper's nest, but I've edited it so that it's got an alleyway down the flank there and it sort of cuts across the deployment zone here for people attacking around this flank and can see the roof. But I've, I've stopped it from being a very powerful long range, you know, middle, um, middle sort of cut across the map kind of shot by adding this forest and especially this large tree here. So I've put so many trees in there that I've completely blocked line of sight to that particular tower. Also, with this uh, relatively small area forest in the middle of the table, and another one here, that um, even though the table's very open, like there's some, um, some levels you can stand on where you can see you know, a huge swathe of the map, the trees mean that it's uh, saturation, like minus one burst, so that uh, prevents that kind of thing from being as effective. Like if you've got a missile launcher on a link team, it's suddenly only firing one missile per reaction, which helps to balance that out a little bit. Having said that, there's still a big road there where there's a massive fire lane along here. This flank, again, huge lines. So, you know, you've gotta, you've gotta be mindful of what you're getting yourself into when you play on this table. Again, here's another example of a forest being used to, um, you know, 
nerf the the fire lane a little bit by p providing that saturation zone. I quite like also that this building's got an opportunity of being a way of models sort of getting through here and coming to the other side of the map without having to cross these long fire lane angles. And this particular side of the building has only got a couple of windows there. And you can control this building um, by moving up and down levels and having infiltrators in there to sort of fight over it. So I thought that's quite, quite, quite cool. And at the back here, hopefully enough scatter terrain so that there's uh, places to deploy, um, you know, in total cover, just for your safest stuff. Like if you've just got a, a normal light infantry lieutenant, you should find somewhere on this map where he's just completely safe against anything ab apart from maybe impersonators or drop troops, which to be honest, if they're investing in those, they should be able to find you no matter where you are. Um, also a little bit of, um, you know, just a, a bit of terrain off the map as well, just to give a bit of a visual appeal, even though it may not affect uh, anything apart from this little crossover here. Um, just one final one, a little bit more of an exotic setup. I'll just show you the, um, the ship dock. In fact, I'll show you two more. Here's the ship, ship dock. This is a bit more of a, a non-standard unorthodox table because you've got the 4x4 four four mat, and I've added the ship as well. So this is a non-standard infinity table because you'll be able to deploy on the ship. The sea is deep water, so no real point going in there. And even if you are a, like a cutter that can deploy in there with no problem, um, you're not really gonna be able to see the rest of the table very effectively. But the cool thing about the ship is that in scenarios like um, quadrant control, um, frontline supremacy, that kind of thing, the ship will sort of count for like one of the zones, right? The, the quadrant will extend into there. Um, if you're taking this table side, you can set up behind this little, um, little console here, but you might find yourself working through uh, you know, the, the ship part of the map just to attack uh, enemy troopers that are deploying down this side. And of course you wanna leave or into the ship, you got these bridges. So I thought that's kind of fun, but it makes for a slightly larger infinity map. You can also uh, dominate the long sort of side sideline zones here by putting a sniper prone on top of one of these uh, towers, for example. I've deliberately made it so there's some really long horizontal um, you know, map dividing uh, lines of fire, which can be controlled by being on the ship. But of course, you can get up on top of these crates. So there is that as well. Generally, we make it so you can't deploy on the crane. So you might have to come up with house rules for some of your terrain if it's too powerful. Like if I'm showing up at a tournament and I you know, visit another player um, or at the start of the, um, the game, uh, we may talk about the fact that we're going to agree not to allow snipers on top of this crane, for example. In fact, with the Infinity models in the tabletop simulator, you actually can't place them there because there's no collision, so the models will actually literally fall off onto the table if you put them there, so that further sort of cements that. Um, as for the table itself, again, um, there's some really long fire lanes in this one. One guideline I've, I've sometimes found people put out with terrain is that you should always uh, cut off the fire line about fire lane about two thirds of the way through it. So if that was the case, you'd want to see some some obstacles here or here from this angle rather than it being a full 48 inch you know fire zone. I, to be honest, don't mind it so, um, too much so long as you've got other parts of the map which are very sort of choked off. Like if you look at this area here, there's so much sort of uh, terrain where it's just jammer and chain rifle heaven and really easy to hide people. Uh, and, and over here as well, that um, it sort of counteracts the, the long fire lanes because if you have a list which is a bit more heavily based on um, the short range stuff, well, you try and play the game and the parts of the table where it suits you better. So you have a table where there are a couple of areas of the table where it's just like long range play, and then a couple of areas of the table where it's a real short range play, and you have the, the dichotomy set up in that particular way. I'm actually just gonna do one last one. Um, here's the, the most recent one I came up with the other night. Okay, so the, the fun thing about this table is that I've deliberately set up a forest in the center and there's no other forests, but this is a table where it's um, you know, quite circular because in the center, you've got these large buildings and that's really the only height that you've got here on the table. The deployment zones are relatively low um, and if you can if you can check it out, the, the forest and the buildings in the middle are completely blocking off the lines of sight from deployment zone to deployment zone. So there's no way to actually see their deployment zone from your deployment zone unless maybe you set up on top of this, this crate here, but even then there's not much you can see. So this is a, this is a, a table where you've got fantastic fire lanes down the flanks like here and here. And if you go to the other, other table side, Yep, you can see all the way down there. That's great. You've got a really awesome angle there 
on this side you can see through to the middle ish and on this side you've got a great line along here so you can imagine this diamond right this diamond uh, across the map where you can cut off people coming around the sides with your snipers and missile launchers but anybody wanting to get at your deployment zone with the short range stuff can make their way through the middle it's just that to get through the middle they themselves are going to have to come into range of assault hackers killer hackers um, guys in hidden deployments maybe with um, mines that can be deployed um, infiltrators with uh, direct template weapons um, some troopers wanting to take the direct approach to the map are going to be slowed down by the forest if they don't have multi-terrain I've rigged it so that there's exactly enough room for a tag or a silhouette for bulletier, for example, to actually walk through here. It's just that they are going to have to contend with the forest and all of the things that forests entail. Um, visually, I've sort of made it like you know the they, they're sort of like they created a little bit of a park for themselves, a little nature reserve uh, of their own in the middle of the the facility, and everything else is just you know all business. The deployment zones themselves. Um, again are relatively safe until you come around the edges so your strategy for this this map might be to use troopers that sort of encircle them and go around the sides a bulleteer drop trooper very good for coming on around the sides there just fast stuff like an arago to a biker or maybe you're planning on being the guy that infiltrates a lot into the center controlling the center and it's going to depend on the mission as well like if this is capture and protect for example usually you do have to go through the middle if it's a mission like um i don't know frontline well you can go around the sides and ignore the middle completely because it's more about the the sections the strips so this kind of table gives you that sort of possibility so if you want to create something like this in your own time in real life or in tabletop simulator if you like the idea of that that is a, a possible sort of table you can come up with all right, well, those are my, my basic thoughts about um, how to play with tables and set them up and things to consider. I know there's a ton more than that. There's a lot of online articles and resources as well where they'll go into more detail about other considerations you might want to keep in mind. People talk quite a lot about scatter terrain and sort of how to sort of break up the area by, okay, you should be able to move six inches and make it from cover to cover, that kind of thing. There's all these little guidelines and, and rules that people like to follow to come up with good tables, but I won't go into that kind of detail here. What I want to talk about next is uh, designing um, tables on the tabletop simulator. So if you aren't planning on doing tabletop simulator, this might be it for you as far as the video goes. Um, but I hope you do give tabletop simulator a go because I think it's um, you know a really cool way of playing Infinity. We've been able to play games with people in other countries and um, have a lot of control over it. Play uh, scenarios, so play with miniatures that we wouldn't normally play, and so forth. Okay, so tabletop simulator. First thing to bear in mind is that obviously whenever you hover your mouse button over anything that's got a 1 or a 2 on it, you can press 1 or 2 on the keypad just to toggle between the deployment zone and the actual mat. With the buildings, you know, you got 1 and 2 and so forth just to toggle that kind of thing. Bridges can be toggled on and off, for example. Um, just bear in mind that um, locking stuff is is really important. When you're working with the, the terrain, um, let me just give you an example of this and let's say you click on something and accidentally um, unlock the the mat you can accidentally pull the mat out from under you and then you, your board is completely scrapped um, it's very hard to get the mat back there uh, manually but what you can do is you can just load a save of that or you can even go um, open um, if I just go and delete this map for example uh, what you can do is go workshop uh, you can expand the list of items in that workshop and it will give you a list of all the items loaded in that particular instance and if you go and find the item you need you can actually respawn it exactly where it needs to be so if i click spawn here it just comes back exactly the spot it needs to be you can right click it check that toggles are locked note that that items that have several modes like one and two you may need to lock both of them otherwise uh, if you're in the wrong mode and it's unlocked you can still move it around the reason you lock stuff is that you don't want to be accidentally clicking on a crate when you're trying to move a model and then suddenly your terrain is moved around. But when you're setting up the table, obviously you're locking things and that makes it easy for copy pasting. So control V, copy pasting and that kind of thing. Also, um, if you're copying and pasting, it will just appear in the same sort of manner that you copied it. So if you want to lay them on top of each other after rotating around, you rotate, copy, and then you can just paste directly on it, right? Whoops. You can also turn off the physics and the gravity so that it won't do that kind of thing as much. 
one other thing to bear in mind with um, with the tabletop settings is is the physics. Um, in the menu under configuration, uh, there are these physics options where you can play on semi-locked or locked. Semi-locked is usually the way the the way to go because it'll bounce around a little bit. Um, but if you go completely locked, where you just move it and it, it won't bounce around, you won't really be able to nudge it either. And nudging nudging stuff's important for getting it uh, up next to bits and pieces. So nudge, 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 nudge. So that's why we generally play on on semi-locked to get things in the right spots. So you know how to copy paste things. We know how to move things around. You know how to rotate stuff. That should be all you really need for creating the buildings. Obviously, um, you guys probably figured this out now, but you can go to this control panel, click stage, it'll remove it. Uh, there may be some preset maps where you can uh, drag and drop the, the bag onto the um, green button and it will populate it for you. What I prefer to do is just save, save the instances. So once I've created a, a table, I just have a saved game here which I can just reload and that allows me to expand the items and, and drag and drop bits and pieces out. Um, unfortunately the basic Infinity Tabletop mod only comes with these basic battle mats and the basic buildings which get a bit tiresome because we've all played on the ubiquitous crates and, 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 and bits and pieces like this and the scatter terrain is a bit limited so you might be thinking well how do I create an awesome looking table with you know, little uh, cars and trees and things like that. Well, to do that, you're gonna actually have to come and uh, check out the workshop. So on Steam, you go to Tabletop Simulator, you browse the workshop, and there are literally thousands of you know uploads that people have made. And you can look through them all here. You have to click on see all items, and you can click search, for example. And um, most of these are just board games, right? But you'll find bits and pieces, like if you put in Necromunda, for example, you can see a lot of the Necromunda bits and pieces, and if we load up, uh, if you click on the subscribe button to one of the um, the uploads that people have put into the workshop, you can come back into Tabletop Simulator, find it under Workshop here, and you can find one of your saves. For example, a really awesome one that I use is called Rusted Cars. So you load up rust, Rusted Cars, and you can find this person's instance, their save game of just the cars, and these look at these models, they're just so beautifully detailed especially compared to, the, compared to the stuff in the Infinity mod. And what that allows you to do is right click on a car and click on save object, or even better, hold down left click and drag and select them all, right click and save object. And that will mean that under objects, under saved objects, you've got access to a whole, a whole list of different things. So that you can see my little collection here. So next time when you click on rusted cars, for example, if I go back to um, workshop, Corvus Bellows Infinity, load that up if you're going to use this as your template. I create myself a bit of a different template where I've got all the, the tokens all laid out and uh, the, the room set up the way I like it as my template. But here's the, the template of the actual basic mod itself. If we go to the table and uh, remove everything, go to battle mats, for example, choose a battle mat we want. Let's say we want the, um, the street one, drag and drop it. Um, either right click and lock or hover over and click L for lock and then right click or maybe just go to 2 and make sure you lock the measurement version of it as well. Then if we go up to objects and go saved objects and click on our rusted cars just to click and they all populate. So what you can then do is actually move your cars around to place them on the map and once you finish moving them hover over it and lock it so it can't be interacted with and then you've got this beautiful car as part of your terrain and if you don't want to use all the cars well just delete them and um, maybe you've just got this one car note that if you unlock it and it's move around movable around you can copy them so you've got tons of these so that's that's fine as well and don't forget as well you can scale up either by using this menu here or I believe like the um, plus and minus like if you if you find something from the workshop that's too big or too small that's the way of scaling it to infinity size 28 millimeter, just relative to the models. That's that's really awesome. So what that allows you to do is create these tables where there's these awesome um, trees or um, um, buildings or other miniatures, rocks and kind of things. Some of my recommended ones are, you know, those cars. One called Vess's Trees and Forest Collection is one of my absolute favorites so far. This thing's just crazy, like the amount of work that's into it. Like, look at all these trees. She's done it with all the different colors, all the different shapes and sizes. Note that you can rescale this anyway, just for a bit of variability. You can sort of twist them around so forth. And with my forest terrain, I like to combine this setup with um, like a foliage uh, setup as well. 
where um, oh, I haven't, haven't found it. It's on a workshop. Trees and bushes. It should be here. Um, where you can actually mix it in with the foliage, right? Um, there's also a little. Um, uh, uh, in fact, I've found the wrong one. I think it's under rock models, RPG models, trees and bushes. There's there's one particular one. Um, what I'll do is I'll load up one of my own tables to demonstrate this a little bit uh, more effectively. If I go back to Forested, for example, um, there are some models where it doesn't have any collision size. So I'll just show you what's actually going on in this table, for example, and how I've managed to achieve this effect. And you might want to do something similar. If I go to this object here and right click it and take it off lock and then I drag it, what you're actually seeing here is there's a very, very thin texture and it's just sitting there. And if I, if I move it somewhere like over here and drop it down, as soon as you click on something else, you can sort of see that it's just leaves on the ground. And the great thing about this is that it doesn't interact with the models in any way. So if we go over and just grab a sample model um, from a left, we come over here and we drop our DASU. As long as I've got this locked, it's just part of the game now. And if I move the DASU over, it's just going to sit in the grass and actually not knock over anything like that. And if I nudge it around, it's just not going to interact that with, with that in any way. Uh, the same is not true of these boxes, for example. If I move this guy, it's just going to bump into it. Unfortunately, there are also some models where um, it's bigger than it looks. Like, it's quite hard to get the DASU in cover next to these crates. Because the collision size of the, these crates, in some cases, is a bit weird. Actually, the crate's not the best, best example. Um, the ones that have been designed for games like 40k and Necromunda generally have been designed quite well. But um, some of the basic stuff, in fact, uh, what I'll do is I'll go to uh, Scatter Terrain here. This is some of the stuff that comes with the Infinity mod, like, like this, this truck, for example. We lock the truck, and then we try and move into cover behind the truck by nudging. Note that the truck is actually taking up more space than it looks like. Especially the, the top of it. Like, it actually it actually is a bit bigger than it appears. So that's why it's quite hard to move the, the DASU, like, right up next to it. So some models are quite badly designed for war games in the sense that you know they they aren't really true to what they appear to be, whereas the, the crates you can sort of put them put them right next to it. But the foliage, for example, takes up no space whatsoever. So some of these little bits here are just empty, and then the trees do actually take up a little bit of space. So some of these objects have been quite well designed. So when you're going through the workshop and you're copying and pasting bits to use in your inventory. Just be aware of you know how practical it's going to be in your Infinity games before using a lot of it. Um, the, the cars uh, do quite well as, uh, as well. So that's how I create these forests. Um, basically, you import the objects and you save them as the objects from the workshop. It's all free, by the way. There is some DLC stuff in Tabletop Simulator, but you don't really have to use it or rely on it. Um, and then you can create some quite interesting effects. Um, I actually consider this forest to be a quite, quite a low-effort for forest. Um, it's quite easy to just copy and paste everything. Just quickly coming back to this little bit of, um, of, of grass here. If I go back to it and unlock it, another thing you can do is copy and paste a whole bunch of them over each other and swivel them a bit so that they're not so m monotonous and uh, repetitive looking. And as they all bunch together, you can group select them and lock it. Bear in mind that if you've got the tabletop underneath that, you may have inadvertently unlocked the table, so just be careful about that. And then when you're looking at it, it looks like it's just a bit more of a a patch of leaves as opposed to a particular drawn out design. It looks a little bit more organic. So that's how I actually create um, the forest template. And again, if you want to know exactly where it is for you know argument's sake and uh, being very perfectionist about what, whether, the, whether your model's in the forest or not, well, you just switch on the, the white background, zoom right in, and you can pretty easily see. So if you've got your DASU and you just want to demonstrate to your opponent that you're actually not touching the forest, well, you just zoom in and everything's fine cool well that's about all I had to say there about creating infinity tabletop um, a last little bit here is that you can go up to options under lighting some people might find this a bit gimmicky and stupid but I've been having a lot of fun with it 
Um, you can play around with the light intensity and so forth just to give a bit of a, di uh, a vibe to your game. This is something you can't really do very easily with your real life games unless you've got a, a room lit up for it. But you can change the kind of, of, of lighting um, that your room has at a touch of a button and a slider which I think is really cool. You obviously wouldn't really want to play on a table that looks like this because it's so hard to see what's going on, but you can have a little bit of that, bit of that going on without it looking particularly cheesy, so that's that as well. Well, guys, um, finally, I just want to say um, thank you to everybody who's joined my Discord recently. We've um, got a ton of people in there. We've got a ton of people actually playing games. I've, I've probably played more than 10 to 15 games of Infinity on Tabletop Simulator over the last week. It's been super fun. I met some really cool people, playing people from England, France, America, um, Australia. It's been really, really cool. Uh, I will be doing a lot more Infinity content on... Um, on, uh, on YouTube for Tabletop. I will be doing some more army, army reviews and sectorials in future, obviously, and um, hopefully at least once every couple of weeks, um, you know, a report from an actual real live miniatures game. Cool, all right, we'll leave it there. Hope you guys enjoyed it and see you again soon.